Well, Dr. Ruth, thank you for joining me. I, I looked at your materials and I started to realize where well, you are one of the few people who actually understand this oxalate issue. It doesn't jump on these silly bandwagons where people uh, make wild claims about how to manage it with such things as nutrients uh, or um, supplements or diet. Now, uh, could, could we start by having you tell us something about yourself? Yes. Oh, hi, Dr. Davis. It is such a pleasure to be with you this morning. And um, I'm thrilled that you invited me on to talk about oxalates because, yes, you're right, there's a lot of misinformation. Um, I have a very varied background. Um, I just defended my doctoral dissertation in holistic nutrition the day before lockdown. Prior to that, I was, well, I probably worked on my doctorate for about 10 years, but what got me into that was doing um, legislative research for raw milk in North Carolina. And so I just, you know, the senator that I was working with, Senator Kay Hagan, um, just told me that there were a couple of issues that were going to be major barriers for us being able to do anything about legalizing raw milk. And she named the couple of different issues, which was listeria outbreak in 2000 and, and another one. And I got into that looking, uh, doing the research. And as I was doing more and more research, I fell in love with just digging and looking all over the place. Um, and so that's what really prompted me to get my, my dissertation, I went to get my doctorate in holistic nutrition. And so while I was working on my doctorate, they started in North Carolina the dietitians started going after uh, anybody that was not a dietitian that was giving out nutrition advice. And I thought, oh my goodness, what's that going to do to me? Well, I also kind of spearheaded the campaign to get the dietitians to settle down and back off of people like Steve Cooksey that you recommend that you um, talked about in there who had been absolutely hunted down by the dietitians. Um, so I I, with that, I decided, you know what, I don't want to have to deal with this. I'm having a, a license. I went back and got my reactivated Myra and license. So we're kind of off topic, but what became of that dietitian? Oh, oh, okay. What they did. Yeah. Thank you. What they did do was, um, well, you know, I really kind of launched a torpedo and said, you know, let's just get rid of the dietetics board because they are not really protecting anybody. So that one, that, that just started everything. And that got a lot of the legislators involved and they saw what was going on with Steve Cooksey and other people. And so they got the, the dietitians to, to stand off and then they have advanced nutrition practice laws. So they do recognize other people other than just registered dietitians. Oh, that's so, excellent. Good for you. Good for you. Oh. <laughs> back, back to the topic of, uh, yes. of interest. Oxlade. So what took you down this path? of battling the oxalate misinformation campaign? Well, you know, when I was working on my, my doctorate, I, my doctorate in magnesium, I knew that kidneys were very important. Magnesium is vital to kidneys. And that, um, so when I started, I read a book and I said, no, this is so not right. This is, there's so much misinformation in this book and they take a little shred of this and they twist it over there. So. I just started debunking every single claim that wasn't right or was actually misquoted if it even came from the literature. And, you know, the one one thing that um, jumped out at me in the book that said, don't think for a minute that a probiotic can help you or has really basically anything to do with, with oxalates. And I thought, all right. So I, I really got into that because of magnesium and actually magnesium is wonderful. It's a, um, an antagonist to oxalate. When your magnesium is low, then, you know, oxalates and a whole bunch of other things are going to go wrong in your body. So that was really what kind of led me into that path. I, I, I saw your slide deck and you summarize the science very nicely. You want to talk about the use of low oxalate diets for high levels of oxalate? And, and why is oxalate even a concern? Well, oxalate is, is a concern because, you know, kidney stone disease, and there are three different types, but the majority are calcium oxalates and magnesium and calcium are kind of paired. They're antagonists. They, they work in tandem, just like sodium and chloride do. So 
being that it was calcium oxide, it, it's increased. We've always had, as, as a human, as a race, we've always had issues with kidney stones for millennia. But it's gotten worse, really, since the Industrial Revolution. It's really, I think in the last, I think, I don't know, 70 years, it's more than doubled. And it's continuing. And now even children are having uh, kidney stones. And, and the thing about the kidneys is once you destroy those nephrons, which are the little tubules and, and the little units that work in the kidneys, once you destroy them, you can't get them back. So, you know, it's really dangerous. And you see, you know, every other block now has a dialysis, you know, center. You know, that's, that's really disturbing. So um, anyway, oxalates can be really damaging to the kidneys. So it's, you know, important that you look at it in terms of a low oxalate diet. Well, really, that's okay, but that's not a fix because what the literature says is, and what they've shown historically, is once you lower the oxalate or remove it from your diet altogether, you lose the ability to be able to clear it, and then you absorb even more. Yeah, I know that I've seen the evidence that suggests that high levels of oxalate, blood, and urine can be blamed, at least in part, for a lack of lactobacillus and bifidobacteria species, yes. which, of course, you and I interpret as dysbiosis and perhaps SIBO, small mm -hmm. intestinal bacterial overgrowth, where we have mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, fecal microbes, proteobacteria, replacing many of the beneficial bacteria, including lactobacillus and bifidobacteria. Have you come across much of a conversation relative to SIBO and oxalates? Yes, absolutely. It's the number one thing that's driving the, the oxalates in terms of, and, and like I shared in my, in my slide deck, that actually it's not, oxalates don't just come from the diet. We make them inside and that, you know, it's part of the glucose pathway. So if you're eating a diet that's high in glucose and, you know, it's sugars and soda and all the other garbage that's in processed food, you know, your body can't clear that and it's going to build up oxalates. Then you decide you want to go on a healthy diet and have a spinach smoothie well, that is just like a, a torpedo of oxalates. And a lot of people have had acute kidney injury due to that kind of overload of oxalates and the inability of the body to clear it. So the other thing, Dr. Davis, it's so important for everybody to understand is that we don't have any enzymes as human beings to be able to clear oxalates. We require um, oxalobacter, um, that bacteria to be able to help us clear it. Now there are a whole bunch and they're finding way more, as you pointed out with the, the lactobacillus, that there are a lot of other bacteria that are in there that can also clear um, the oxalates. But if your gut is destroyed and you don't, you're overloading on processed foods, and then you decide you wanna have a spinach salad, then you're gonna have issues. It all makes sense, doesn't it? When you step back and you recognize all that's gone wrong, mm -hmm. some of it aided and abetted by dietary guidelines, of course. Oh, yes. The proliferation of ultra-processed and processed foods and the dominance of the processed food industry, combined with, of course, the atomic bomb of antibiotics on your microbiome, as well as other factors. Uh, have, have you gotten so far as to develop a specific strategies that is, so I, I assume you're not advocating a low oxalate diet, but advocating other strategies. Could you articulate some of those things? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, what I tell everybody to do, and Dr. Davis, thank you so much for super gut, because in my presentation that I did originally with this oxalate article, is that, you know, I, I just tell everybody to heal your gut first, you know, and, and slowly go through it, because, you know, if, if it is so torn up, whatever you do, you're going to have histamine issues. You're going to, you're going to be, you know, intolerant to just about everything. So an interesting, an interesting point to that is that I think that that's why people have navigated towards something like the carnivore diet, because that's not as taxing on the small intestine. You can get your nutrients, you can heal, you can avoid histamines and, and, um, all these other things that are so hard for the small intestine to handle. You know, it's, it's really interesting that uh, plant foods, you know, we talk about polyphenols and, and flavonoids and all that other stuff. 
those are actually recognized by our small intestines as as xenobiotics, which are like not us. They're anything other than human. Whereas like on the carnivore diet, you're eating fat and protein. That is like us. That's easier for our intestines to be able to digest. So I think that's really what has in a way driven a lot of people to carnivore is because they can get rid of all of the 8,000 different kind of chemicals that come with plant foods, you know, and, and heal. So that's what I tell people to do is to really, you know, pull everything out and go slowly, slowly work back, just go with pure whatever proteins that you can have that are, you know, originally sourced whole food proteins, and then slowly add things back in little by little. And then definitely, uh, you know, getting on this, the super gut um, yogurt is critical. And I think, yes, with the, you were brought up that the l ruteri sometimes releases histamines, but again, if you're taking that slowly, it's okay. I think another really good thing that you have brought out is the Esculardi fruit drink. I think that that does also help. Maybe I think that is one of the things I tell people to start with, something slow. They get into being able to ferment things. It doesn't take long. You can't really do anything. It's not quite as, not that the yogurt is complicated, but the um, the Boulardi drinks are, are pretty easy and you can watch it and you can just sip a little bit, you know, and that helps to then start reseeding the gut and restoring the gut. What role do you see for uh, fermented vegetables? Oh, absolutely. You know, you know, one of the things that this one book talked about is how vegetables, we don't eat these kind of vegetables. Nobody ate these kind of high oxalate vegetables. Oh, yes, they do. And yes, they did for a long time. And because that was one of the things that I went back and looked at. I was like, wow, you know, what do we ever do? Well, um, it turns out to answer your question, it turns out that fermenting helps to to degrade and reduce all the oxalate content. And that's why we've been doing that for so long that, you know, we knew that and we didn't know it under a microscope, but that's what our ancestors did. And they're doing it all over the world. And, you know, even originally being part of that carnivore, because I had to heal my own gut, I had a whole bunch of histamine issues. But I started to think before I really started getting into the oxalates, I started to think, well, you know, what's wrong with eating just all meat and, and, and fat. You know, the, the Eskimos don't get five servings a day of fruits and vegetables. Boy, was I wrong. When I started digging, it turns out, yes, the Inuits and the people in the, in the, the Arctic regions actually eat a lot of high oxalate foods. They, but they ferment them and they store them and they put them away and they know how to prepare them. So yes, we do need to have, as Dr. Davis points out all the time, we do need to have a full range of, of different things, not just for us, but to feed our microbiome and to keep it healthy and flourishing. And really now that's the way I tell everybody to eat. You're eating for your microbiome. That's your other half. We're like Siamese twins. You know, what excites me about the whole microbiome aspect of controlling oxalate levels is the science that tells us that Various microbes reduce oxalate by different mechanisms, mm -hmm. which of course suggests that there may be synergies where two plus two equals 10. Absolutely. We can get a much larger effect than yes. you might say with just following. Have you, have you come across any, well, has this led to any concrete strategies beyond say fermented foods or lactobacillus rotari? I, you know, with oxalates, it's not quite, quite your, uh, answering your question, but another thing is uh, it's the number one predictor of antibiotic use. And they only figured that out when they were using antibiotics to try to get rid of um, Helicobacter pylori. And then they found that the oxalate levels dropped. So the, the uh, oxalobacter levels, sorry, of, of that particular strain that gets rid of it. And so, you know, Primitive living, primitive cultures in developing countries, they have that bacteria and, and we don't. But anyway, it's just like so much is just, ex, it's, it's exploding in the last little while. And I think Dr. Davis, again, that's what's so exciting about the research work that you're doing and finding the exact strains specific and not just going off trying to find a probiotic. Because I know a lot of people ask, is there a specific probiotic for kidney stones? And, and the answer would be no. You just need to kind of heal your gut and rebuild what I call is like an orchestra in your gut. Because, you know, you can't just play with one 
one group or, you know, worst case with processed food, have a whole rap party in there. So, <laughs> rap music, that's not going to make the right, right tones. And, you know, I, I think another thing that I point out that I found in doing this research is that upwards of like 60% of the metabolites that are in our blood come from gut microbes. So, you know, there's so much that they're doing for us that we don't even recognize and we've ignored them because we have just been human centric. And I think a lot, it goes back to, you know, this whole um, perspective on oxalates are horrible, don't eat them, is because that's human centric. And I think that's also what's so lagging in med medicine right now is we just are so focused on our numbers and we're not looking at what's going on with the gut yet. You know, I'm thrilled that you've been able to connect the dots. So few have. Um, and I, you, I, I couldn't agree more, Ruth, that, that, that the insight to the microbiome make us realize how little we actually knew about how oh so Absolutely. many things are giving way to the emerging microbiome. It could be oxalates, could be uric acid. It could be pancreatic cancer and gallstones. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think you've come to the same conclusion I had, and that is... Yeah. If you want full control over your health in this age of health disasters and health mismanagement, you really have to understand what's going on in the microbiome. I love your orchestra analogy because I think that's true. If all you do is get a tuba and a timpani, <laughs> you're not going to have much good music. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Well, Dr. Ruth, thank you very much. I value your insights. I'd like to keep this conversation going in future and bring you back with some regularity, bring, bring us updates on how this science is unfolding. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure.